Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes for NTAC 222, the Cisco CCNA2 course, Routing and Switching Essentials. This is Chapter 8, DHCP. We're going to look at two forms of DHCP. DHCP as used in an IPv4 network and DHCP as used in an IPv6 network. Looking at how DHCP is used with IPv4, DHCP is the idea that you can have a server or a device like a router or a switch assign addresses to clients on the network so that you don't have to manually configure them. In many of the labs we do in class, we're manually configuring the PCs, the switches, the routers, and we're going around and typing in their IP address, their mask, their gateway. Um, that's not such a big deal, but it doesn't scale well to your larger networks. You pretty much need to have a DHCP server, which will automatically um, assign these things out dynamically upon request. So the device would send out a, a broadcast and request an IP um, address and additional network settings, and it would receive them from the server, and we call this a lease. It would look something like this. The client initiates it by making a broadcast called the DHCP discover message, which says, I need an IP address. Then an offer is made, which is a unicast, because remember, this is, this is a non-routable, broadcasts are not routable, so we can make a unicast back because we're using layer two frame, right? This is a layer two frame broadcast because the client has no IP. So the client is sending a layer two broadcast, which is FFFFF um, is the destination and the source is of course the client's own MAC address. This allows the DHCP offer to be unicasted directly to the client. The server would use its own MAC address and it would address it to the client's MAC address. So it's a broadcast that's heard by the entire network segment asking for an address, and then a reply, which is the DHCP offer, sent back as a unicast. Then a broadcast is sent saying that the client accepts the offer. Now, could a unicast be used here? Yeah, absolutely. The client knows the server's MAC address. The reason it's a broadcast is in case the client has received several offers. So let's say in the broadcast, the client have reached several DHCP servers. It may have received several offers. By sending a single broadcast announcing which offer was accepted, the other servers know that their offer was not accepted. So they can go ahead and put those addresses back in the pool and have them available for other potential clients. So that's the reason or purpose for the DHCP request to be a broadcast. Then there's a unicast um, DHCP acknowledgement, which is sent back from the server saying, got it, I acknowledge that you have accepted the offer and it's yours, right? And so that's that kind of four messages, the DHCP discover, DHCP offer, DHCP request, and DHCP acknowledgement. You'll need to know those for the exam. So that is how a DHCP address is leased. When you want to renew a lease, if you're a client, it's a more abbreviated process. You just send a unicast to that server. No, no broadcasts are involved here. You send a unicast directly to the server where you have leased your IP settings and say, I'd like to renew, right? The lease is basically a period of time, could be an hour, a day, a week. And at about halfway through the lease, the client is going to start attempting to renegotiate the lease. In other words, renew it. It will send um, DHCP requests saying, hey, can I renew the lease for another week or another day or whatever the term is? And the um, unicast reply or acknowledgement there, the DHCP acknowledgement says, yes, I've uh, renewed your lease. This is the format of the header for a DHCP message. So this is the information that can be packed in. There is quite a lot of information. What's really interesting is the last field, the DHCP options field. Notice that says variable length. There are virtually an unlimited number of options that you can have with the DHCP message, which is pretty cool. 
DHCP is the third attempt to do this, by the way. We had um, something called RARP, reverse ARP, and then after that we tried BOOTP, which was another protocol. So RARP and BOOTP were predecessors to the DHCP protocol attempting to do the same thing. Some of the problems, if you look at Boot P, which was used, uh, you know, if you look at the video game Doom, for instance, a Doom server still uses Boot P, and many older devices are still Boot P. In fact, all of your newer DHCP servers are backwards compatible with Boot P clients. Boot P can only give out three pieces of information, and so it was fairly limited. You know, uh, the IP address, the mask, and the gateway. Well, in today's world, you want to give out the uh, DNS server, maybe a network time protocol server. Uh, if you're a phone, you want to know where your configuration file is located. There are a myriad of options that you can convey in terms of network settings to these client devices, and DHCP allows for that. So we'll never need to really replace DHCP because it's been built as what we call an extensible protocol. We can add to or extend its functionality. Here's a look again at how it relies on the MAC address. It's using its own MAC address. The client is using that as the source. And the destination is that FFFF frame, which is a broadcast MAC. And notice for the IP addresses, the client doesn't have one. So it's putting 0000. 000, 000, 000 just basically doesn't know its IP address. And for the IP destination, it's using the broadcast 255.255.255.255.255. It's a UDP protocol. So DHCP uses UDP port 67 to send these messages. And you can see all that right here. And then you can see the message coming back. little error here, the, um, the client wouldn't actually have that IP address yet. So a little error in the messaging. So the destination IP is going to continue to be 0 .0 .0 .0, 0.0.0.0. Okay, because the client doesn't yet have that IP address. Okay, a Cisco router running Cisco iOS software, and this includes Cisco switches. So you can take your 2960 um, switches in the lab, and you can also turn them into DHCP service if you want. These are the commands to do that. You have some optional commands here at the top. The first two lines are what's called excluded addresses, and those are addresses within the pool of address. In other words, the pool defines the start and end address. So it says, okay, the pool will be this address to that address. And then within that pool, we can exclude addresses that we want to use for static and manual assignments. So we want to um, have addresses that are not doled out automatically, perhaps. Usually it's pretty normal to reserve the first few addresses and the last few addresses in the pool. You can see here the pool, IP DHCP pool LAN pool 1, is defined as the 192.168.10 network. So we have 254 addresses in our pool, dot one through dot 254, and we are reserving dot one through dot nine. So the first nine addresses are being reserved or excluded using the excluded address command. We're also excluding the last address in the pool dot 254. And you can see the default router, which would be the gateway. So the gateway router is um, dot one. And the server is on, uh, sorry, the DNS server is on some other external network. This is all pretty normal. And there's a domain name. Uh, DNS server is optional. Uh, domain name is optional. Theoretically, the default router is also optional. But if you leave that out, the client will only receive an IP address and a mask. And to be able to reach the internet and external networks, the client will need that gateway. So you'll want to make sure you include the default router for sure. But the DNS server only include that if you actually have a DNS server. Um, oftentimes you may point that towards Google's, which is 8.8.8.8, .8 or maybe towards Comcast or some other ISP that is providing your DNS. So you would just point that towards that um, IP address. You can also, by the way, use a URL there if you wish. And for the domain name, um, you can just make that up or you can leave it out. 
The domain name is helpful for address resolution. So if someone typed like ping printer, it would append uh, example.com. So if you type ping printer, it would actually ping printer.example.com. So that's the reason for providing the domain name is to make it easier for end devices to um, locate their local resources. So if you have a domain, then you would want to include it. If you don't, there's no purpose for it. If you want to turn off DHCP, these settings will stay in there. This is pretty cool. You just type no service DHCP and it disables the DHCP process. So if, for instance, you're having trouble with maybe two competing DHCP servers and you need to troubleshoot that, you could turn one off very quickly with no service DHCP. And that deactivates the DHCP service on this device. And when you want to reactivate it, just type service DHCP. Here's some commands to verify that DHCP is working. Um, these are commands that you would do to take a look at the uh, DHCP settings in the config and verify who the client devices are under the bindings. So the binding command will list each device that is requested and received to DHCP um, network settings, and it records that client's MAC address. So this is a convenient way to verify that a client has actually gotten their DHCP. So you may have a client uh, device, phone, or a printer, or a PC, and you're like, it's just not getting on the network. I, I wonder if it's the DHCP. Well, if you know the MAC address of that client, you can just uh, look it up in the DHCP server. On the PC or the client, you can, of course, just go into the settings and verify that it's uh, gotten the correct um, addressing information. Okay, let's talk about DHCP Relay. So I mentioned in an earlier slide here in this presentation that DHCP uses broadcasts and therefore it can't be routed. So your DHCP server has to be on the same network segment you are. Well, that's not always possible. It's not always um, possible to put a DHCP server on each segment of a network. You have a lot of different segments. We learned that when we learned how to subnet that we would have segments with phones and segments with printers and segments for different buildings and so forth, departments and all of that. So we have a need sometimes to allow devices to reach a DHCP server that is not local to them. Enter the idea of DHCP relay. This is a command for the router that is used nearest the clients that are not located by DNS servers. So let's look at PC1, which is not located near the DHCP server. Notice that the DHCP server is in a different segment over there by PC2. So for PC1 to reach that, that broadcast has to be captured by router1, converted to a unicast, and sent to the DHCP server. We can do that with a single command. So we can put a command on the G00 port of router1, specifying that it should listen for DHCP requests. And if it receives a DHCP request, which remember will be a broadcast, that it should convert that to a unicast and send it to 192.168.11.6, which is our DHCP server. And this is what that command looks like. So you go into interface G00, you type IP helper address, and you just tell it where the DHCP server is, and it takes care of it for you. Pretty useful. You can also configure a router as a DHCP client. There's a lot of times when you want your router to get its address um, dynamically. For instance, when you connect your router to an internet service provider where you're probably not told what your IP address is, your IPS needs, IP address needs to be dynamically um, obtained because you're not paying for a static IP address. So it's very easy. You type the command IP address DHCP. Instead of IP address and specifying the address, just put the keyword DHCP and it will take care of the rest. Here's doing it on a home router. Let's talk about some troubleshooting ta tasks. You have, um, for one task, a need to resolve address conflicts, right? So uh, this can happen, for instance, you may have statically assigned an address that you didn't exclude. So you may have given maybe dot five to a server or a device on your network, but dot five is also being dynamically doled out because it's part of your DHCP pool. That will create an address conflict where there are now two devices on your network with the same IP address. 
You also need to verify physical connectivity from time to time because if a device is not receiving DHCP, it's probably because it doesn't have a physical pathway to the DHCP server. You need to be able to test with a static address. So if we can't get DHCP to work, what we do is try to put a static address. We go in and manually configure the IP settings and see if that works. I mean, it should. And if that doesn't work, then we know it's not a DHCP problem. You have a network connectivity issue. Some other problem could be routing or various things. But we basically say if DHCP is not, not working, we'll, we'll try to bypass it with a static configuration. You need to be able to verify switch port configuration. It could be the ports in the wrong VLAN, for instance, or it's the wrong port type. Sometimes we have a client like a PC or a printer that's plugged into a trunk port. And so it's simply not able to communicate. And we need to be able to test from the same subnet or VLAN. So we often, if we have a device, say it's a printer and it's just not getting an address, it really, the printer has a limited interface for us to get in there and really see what's going on. It can be advantageous to plug in another device in the same subnet or VLAN and see if it can DHCP. Because it could be an issue where no device in that subnet is able to DHCP. So these are some of the commands to do that. Of course, show running config will verify that you have a correct setting for DHCP. In this case, it's an IP helper address. So I go, okay, cool, there's an IP helper address there. And then I take a look to see if I have the no service DHCP command because that would have turned off my DHCP service. So I wanna make sure DHCP is actually up and running. You can also use an access list. We learned those last chapter and you can create an access list. I mentioned this in the lecture last chapter. You can use those with debug command. And here's your opportunity. You have a lab where you get to do this. So in your troubleshooting lab this chapter, you will get to create an access list. And notice this access list is looking for UDP protocol port 67 and UDP protocol port 68. 67 and 68 are, of course, the DHCP process. So now you can say debug IP packet. If you just said debug IP packet, it would debug every packet coming in and out of every interface on the router. You would be overwhelmed with a lot of information, especially in a production environment. But by limiting it to these two ports, we're able to um, filter on, on just the protocol that we want to debug. Unfortunately, we can't limit it to particular IP addresses because remember the DHCP clients don't have IPs, so we can't really get more granular than is shown here. But if it was debugging something else, we might be able to permit specific IP addresses so that we can look at just a certain client on the network. In this case, we can only limit it really to the port number. Let's take a look at DHCP for IPv6. DHCP for IPv6 adds some new capabilities that didn't exist with IPv4. One of the exciting new possibilities is stateless. With IPv4, you only have what's called stateful DHCP, which is where each MAC address is recorded and a lease is created, and that's called stateful, where the state of each client is recorded in a table. That's what stateful means. So stateless would mean I don't record anything as the DHCP server. Clients auto configure themselves. All the router does is provide the gateway IP. Prefix length, some basic information. It says, okay, here's the network you belong to. Make up your own host address and I'm your gateway. Good luck. So it allows the device to get an IP because it will make one up based off of the prefix it's provided. It will um, then have a then it will have a mask and it will have an IP address and it will know its gateway because the router will say, hey, I'm your gateway. But it won't be able to, with a uh, stateless, you're not able to get like a DNS information or additional settings. You would still need to have a DHCP server for that. But this is the way to essentially have clients get their own IP addresses without really having to have the overhead of a DHCP server. So this is obviously a lot faster. Look at this two-step process. There's a router solicitation, which is a multicast, and then there is a multicast back, which is the advertisement. So two multicasts, very quick way to get your settings. OK. 
Hey, of course, you have to have IPv6 up and running before your client uh, can communicate with your router this way. So you'd have to go into your router and turn on IPv6 unicast routing. Notice because you're making up your own address, there is a test done at the end. The client will actually send a multicast, um, which is an all node multicast, which says, is there anyone else using this IP address that I just made up? And if they are, it'll make up a new one. Okay, so that's kind of a way to avoid the duplicate IP address issue that could result when you're making up an address. But realize this is a two to the 64 chance that you'd have a duplicate, so it'd be very rare. Right, Slack and DHCP can work together. So you can start with a router solicitation and a router advertisement, which is Slack. And then the router can say, go to this IP address for additional DHCP settings. So notice the DHCP server won't be providing your IP address. You're gonna make that up yourself using Slack. But if there were additional settings like a DNS address and other network settings, the router could be programmed with where the DHCP server is located that will provide those additional settings. Slack is the default option on Cisco routers for IPv6. Of course, you can turn that off. Stateless DHCP. And remember, stateless DHCP is where it's combined with Slack. So with stateless DHCP, the client uses Slack to get its IP address, find its gateway, and it then contacts the DHCP server statelessly to get the additional settings that it needs. So that's why it's stateless. The DHCP server isn't keeping track. There's no lease. None of that applies. Now, stateful is just like what we learned with IPv4. It's an exact duplicate of the IPv4 process. And notice there's a, there's a four-step um, process here for um, stateful. Same four-step process that we had with IPv4, except we replaced broadcast with multicast. So we're using primarily multicast to carry this out. So you can program the router uh, the way you want it to behave. So you can tell the router, no, I don't want you doing Slack. And then a client that sends a router solicitation would receive back from the router um, an advertisement that said, sorry, I don't do Slack. Here's, here's your DHCP server that you need to contact. So that would be forcing stateful. So you can make this work exactly the way you want. You can allow stateless and Slack, which is the default on routers with iOS 15, or you can modify that with a single command if you want to use stateful. Let's take a look at it. So here we are setting up stateless. So notice with stateless, I don't really need to create a pool of addresses or anything like that because the device is going to make up its own. All I have to do is put the additional settings. In this case, I'm providing the clients the DNS server and the domain name. Okay, so that's the stateless settings this DHCP server will provide the clients. The IP address itself will be delivered using Slack, which is done right on the interface G01. Essentially, the router sends its own address to the client. The client uses that as the gateway, strips off the um, host part, which we call interface ID and IPv6, and replaces it with what we call EUI64, which is a randomly generated uh, last 64 bits of the address. So it'll tear off that, that one there on the end and replace it with a long random number string. What I don't like about Slack is it generates some really ugly IPv6 addresses because it creates 64 bits randomly, which tends to be quite a long number in terms of how we look at it. Remember, the number is always 128 bits in binary, but we can often abbreviate them down very nicely like we have here with the router's address on G01. With a Slack client, it always has a very long, arduous-looking hexadecimal number. 
Okay, and then of course, uh, it's very easy on the client end. This is uh, stateless using a router as the client. Just have to turn on IPv6 and enable auto config. IPv6 address auto config. Notice this is different than IPv6 address DHCP. We're not using DHCP, we're using Slack. And you can verify it's working by taking a look at the setting and seeing that it has picked up those settings that we configured in the stateless DHCP. Now, how about stateful? Well, with stateful, we have to create a pool of addresses. Just like we did before, we can optionally set the DNS server, the domain name. And we have a little different flag that we put. So the ND flag is going to be managed look something like this. In this case, we're setting the lease to uh, lifetime infinite. You could set the lifetime, um, which is the lease, to something else so it expires. So again, this is stateful. So you can have a lease. Uh, the lease time here is being set to infinite, but you could adjust that. Otherwise, pretty straightforward. And notice that the syntax for the client is slightly different. We tell the client, instead of using Slack, we tell it we want to use DHCP and go stateful. So notice the server and the client have to be uh, coordinated. They have to be set correctly. So if you have the client set uh, the wrong way, the client could have difficulty obtaining the IP address information. And of course, we need to verify that it's working. Now let's talk about Relay. Of course, with IPv6, we also have Relay. It's a single command, just like it is with IPv4. And here it is here. IPv6 DHCP Relay destination and then the IP address of our DHCP server. So if we put this on the G00 interface of router 1, like we did with IPv4, we can direct it to the DHCP6 server. A little bit about troubleshooting. Same troubleshooting that we talked about prior. Okay. Using the show commands to verify your settings. You can use the debug. So you can debug the DHCP here. You can also use an access list here with uh, debug with uh, DHCP v6 as well. So in summary, you now know how to explain how IPv4 DHCP servers operate in small to medium-sized networks. You can configure a router as an IPv4 DHCP server. You can configure a router as an IPv4 DHCP client. You can troubleshoot a DHCP configuration in an IPv4 network. You can explain the operation of IPv6 DHCP. You can configure both stateless and stateful. IPv6 DHCP servers, and you can troubleshoot a DHCP configuration for IPv6. Congratulations. Thank you.